early September, the Arctic Northern Sea Route is a busy maritime highway. All of Russia's nuclear-powered icebreakers are at sea, clearing a path for shipping. The crews here have a saying, when you're in the Arctic, you have the whole world at your feet. The route follows Russia's northern boundaries, offering the shortest passage between Europe and Asia, passing through seven northern seas. Well then, three goodbye horns. The nuclear-powered Taimir leaves Murmansk port on schedule. She'll now spend four months patrolling the Northern Sea route. Despite passing through ten time zones, the crew will never adjust the ship's clock. It's quite likely they'll never pull into a port either, and nor will the crew go ashore. Morning! Good morning! Svetlana, you're beautiful! Well done! Don't forget your hat! Oh, it has ruined my hair now. <laughs> the captain and the first officer sit here. They don't like holes in their bread. I have to put more bread out because the navigators sit here and they eat a lot. <laughs> the bosun likes the tables to be laid properly. He likes everything to be good and he likes beautiful women. Actually, he just loves all women. Just like all men, they like pies with fish, cabbage, potatoes. I should know what they like by now. The floor is icy cold and my feet are cold too. I put socks on. Everyone here wears something warm on their feet, because they would just freeze otherwise. Yes, it is cold here, but then we are in the Arctic. This icebreaker was purpose-built for the Arctic. The heavy pack ice won't crush its egg-shaped hull, which squeezes the ice, crushing it beneath the vessel's weight. The propellers are designed for power, not speed. But when the need arises, the Taimir can reach the quite respectable speed of 19 knots. She makes an impressive sight at sea. As the Taimir moves quickly, hurrying to lend assistance. A Russian military fleet is heading along the northern sea route. They are approaching a tough area, and several icebreakers will be needed to clear a path for the vast flotilla. There may be no ice in sight now. But the captain showed me the chart. And up to the north of the Severna Zemlya, the northern land, there's so much ice that if the wind were to change, it would quickly drift towards us, blocking the way. On the surface, life on this ship may seem like any other. As you'd expect, the crew works established shifts, four hours on and eight off, with no rest days. Each crew member works his designated station. Helmsmen on the bridge and engineers below decks, keeping the ship systems at peak performance. But there's one very big difference. She looks like a fairly simple ship, but really she's not simple at all. The Tamir is equipped with a reactor and a very complex security system. Only a handful of people have access to this room, and even they have to wear special clothing and footwear. It's the nuclear reactor that provides the ship with its enormous power. It's thanks to this power plant that the vessel has no need to pull into port for refueling. The nuclear fuel is only replenished once every five years. 
Starting up the icebreaker, which includes checking the reactor system, takes about a week. It's a lot more tricky than starting a car. And you can't shut it down that easily either. Each and every system needs to be started separately, of course. On the inside, the ship is massive, easily equal to a large seven-story building. A newcomer could easily get lost in the enormous labyrinth leading to the engine room. I've worked here for 23 years. Everyone treats this ship with respect because she's the one who puts the bread on our tables. Ask anyone aboard, even their wives. We've always been considered the Navy's elite because the training is very tough and it's hard to get your foot in the door here. On top of that, the exams are extremely difficult as well. Dmitry is new to the nuclear Navy. He's preparing to apply for the position of fourth electrical officer. If he's to get that first appointment here, he'll have to pass a series of exams. There are two applicants competing for the job and the quickest is the winner. Dmitry is determined to be the fastest and be the first to pass all the exams. I'm in charge of everything to do with nuclear safety. Radiation safety is another department's responsibility. Every tiny detail is laid down here. Nuclear safety is a very serious business and we have special guidance to follow. It's quite a thick book. The crew is getting ready for a long tour covering the southern shores of the Arctic Ocean. The tunnel through the Kara Gate that connects the Kara and Barents Seas is thought of as the official start of the Northern Sea Route. The Kara Route is a reference point. It's where the tour begins and ends. Love lasts only until the Kara Gates. After them, it counts for nothing. It was 22 years ago in August that I started work here. I wanted to get married at some point. My first tour was on the Vaigach. And I met a guy there. They warned me. Love only lasts until the car gates. Then he'll forget you. But he didn't. It lasted up to the gates and beyond and all the way back again. One, two, three, four, five, six. The Taimir finally catches up with the fleet in the Vilkitsky Strait. Ten military ships have been given a special task in the Arctic, but there's nothing but thick ice between them and their destination. The icebreakers provide the only means for such a long naval convoy to cross the icebound strait. Yamal, Yamal to Taimur. Can you adjust the position? We can take your place or maneuver between? We'll adjust. Come alongside. We're approaching. Adjust five degrees. Slow down. Into the wake, okay? Into the wake, got you. Central control room to bridge, lower it to 10%. Icebreaker Taimur joined the fleet at 1430 and took its place in the convoy. Greetings to all present from the Icebreaker Taimur. Greetings Taimur, this is Simon, over. And from Vygach. Yamal sends greetings from the line. Thanks. This exercise provides a unique opportunity to see all of Russia's nuclear-powered ships together. Seamen call the Big Red Icebreakers our knights. The 50 Years of Victory is one of the most powerful ships in the world. It can break ice as thick as three meters, while the White Icebreakers, Taimir and Vygach, are smaller and can even lead the fleet into frozen Siberian river estuaries. 
school. When I was at school, in the fifth grade, I guess, they told us about the first nuclear-powered icebreaker, the Lenin. And as I sat there listening, I thought, my God, these guys are real heroes. They are fantastic. Back then, I could never even have thought that I myself might become just as fantastic, a real hero like them. <laughs> The first nuclear-powered icebreaker, Lenin, was commissioned in 1959. The whole world was talking about the USSR making the atom serve mankind. The phrase, atom for peace, became a popular expression. Skeptics joked that the Soviet Union was obsessed and even wanted to fit atomic engines into planes and ships. Now, though, no Arctic expedition can be staged without the nuclear-powered Russian icebreaker fleet. They've proved themselves extremely reliable. In all the years they've been in service, there has not been a single nuclear accident, and nor has one of them ever failed to complete an assignment. It shouldn't cross the line and come any closer. It should maintain distance. It may look as though the ships are crossing clear water, but in fact the icebreakers are driving many tons of ice from their path with an ingenious device known as a pneumatic washing system. It's no easy task navigating this many ships through so much ice. Normally there are no more than two ships. Now we're leading a total of 14. I was supposed to be aboard the Vygach, the ship behind us. But my daughter was born in July and I thought I should take a break. I took a vacation and now I'm catching up. The most important thing is that my wife understands that I have to go to sea and doesn't worry. Yevgeny, look how beautiful it is. The ship behind us. You're lucky, you get to see it from the bridge all the time. I chose this job as a child. Time on board, 11.30, good day. Lunch is served. Bon appetit, everyone. Today, along with the Yamal, Vaigach, and 50 years of victory icebreakers, we will continue to lead the fleet of 10 Russian Navy ships. We're currently in the Laptev Sea, 20 miles northeast of the Komsomolskaya Pravda Island. Yamal, commence left turn, course 90 degrees. This is Seaman, message received. Roger. This is Seaman. Dmitry hopes the first officer will tell him exactly what tests he needs to pass, but now it seems is not the time to ask. There's a thick block to your right near the entrance. Ease forward, we'll shift it and return. Understood. For the ice-breaking navigators, each trip is a new first time. Every route changes dramatically in just a few hours. The ice will never remain the same for more than a few minutes. There's something else to consider. You can see strips of ice now, but if a southerly wind blows, they'll all vanish. But if we get a northerly wind blowing through, they'll reappear. Fog has descended on the fleet. So thick that it's almost impossible even to make out the lights on the ship in front. The Tymir is in front of me. The fog is very thick. No visual on Tymir's lights and drifted. Now at one, three, zero degrees. Up until 7 a.m. visibility was absolutely fine. Maintaining convoy formation at such close distances through ice and fog is a major challenge. The ships are surrounded by so much ice that the radar display looks quite blank. Every crew member needs to concentrate. The icebreaker captains, though, are experienced seamen, and fog is a regular event in autumn. New ice has already begun to appear, and that always means fog. We are laying the table for dinner. There is a lot of work to do. We're constantly on the go, because if you take a break and sit down to chat, even for five minutes, you'll be late. So we just can't do it. 
Despite the fog and two meters of ice, the crew maintains a regular schedule. Svetlana was cleaning the inner decks when she heard her favorite song, so she stopped what she was doing and went to listen to the music. Right, I better go. No, sit, sit, look at her. Look, she's wearing a red dress. If the first officer sees us, he'll hang me from the mast. I'm kidding. The icebreaker led the military convoy for almost four days. The toughest stage is behind them. There'll be clear water now, all the way to the new Siberian islands. Icebreaker captains, we've undertaken a unique operation, perhaps the first of its kind in Russian naval history. Every one of the Russian Federation's nuclear-powered ships was involved. I wish to express my gratitude to the icebreaker crews and wish you luck and safe passage in this region. Turn right, course 180 degrees. Hi, course 180. The icebreakers peel away and leave the fleet behind. Now there are other ships waiting for their help. We escort these ships and head back to the 109th Meridian. All the other ships from the east will have arrived by the time we get there, and we'll run back and forth again. When the ship is alone and not on escort duty, the crew usually try to organize a variety of tasks that involve every seaman aboard. Today, there are rumors of a training drill after lunch. The drill's starting soon. We should all get in position. Oh god, our work can get quite extreme out here. <laughs> the notice board informs each crew member where they can find their allocated lifeboat seat. Which is my lifeboat? Boat 1. Which boat number is yours? 21? Let's look it up. Look. There won't be a drill today. Look. I'm breaking all the rules. I've left my station early. <laughs> The guys are saying there is no drill, it's cancelled. Was that a joke? In the end, it was a false alarm. Aboard the icebreakers, rumors are jokingly referred to as news from the galley, or abbreviated to wows, what one woman said. Dimitri is confident that he's now well prepared. He wants to pass the exams first, and has already spoken to the first officer about sitting the test tomorrow. Well, it's not all yours, some of it's ours. And official policy. Yes, I got you. Thank you. You're welcome. You see? Days aboard the icebreaker are all much the same. The only thing that changes are the ships trailing in its wake. Good day! Duty officer to central control room. We're escorting the tanker Boris Vilkitsky, which will take approximately one more day. Other than that, no other news. Have a safe shift. Roger, understood. Safe shift to you too. Dimitri has passed his test with flying colors, and he'll take up his new post in a matter of days. In early autumn, the northern sea route becomes almost completely free of ice making it the busiest time of the year for navigation on this chilly sea lane. We covered the whole lane across the Arctic, and there was no ice anywhere. But if there's just one block, it's over. No ship could move on without our help. You see for yourself how navigation across the Arctic is much more active now. Maybe the fact that there's not so much ice now would account for that. There's navigation to be done in the Arctic, and there's a lot of work for us. And a lot of ships. Traveling from Europe to Asia along the Northern Sea Route is much quicker than the better known voyage through the Suez Canal. It will take the tanker 22 days to reach Shanghai from Murmansk. 
The Suez Canal route would take 40 days, making the Arctic option a great deal cheaper in crew and fuel costs. The prospect of using the North Sea route all year round has become a hot topic. Technology is advancing, the climate is changing, and ice is melting, and raw materials are becoming ever more expensive. But aboard the icebreakers, the Arctic's potential is seen very differently. When you get here, you forget about everything. When you're at home, you get bogged down with domestic problems. Life is very different here. Once my wife and I worked out that out of 30 years of married life, I've only spent 14 at home. I miss those years I spent at sea. I didn't play a part in bringing up my children. One time I came home and they were small, the next they were grown-ups. When I worked in the Far East, I used to bring back clothes and things, boots for example, for my eldest daughter. And when I got back home, it turned out they were already too small. So next time I brought bigger ones, but by the time I got home, they were too small as well. I've had enough of the sea and the Arctic. I spent 35 years here. I first saw my son a year and a half after he was born. I wasn't there when my wife left the maternity home, after any of our children, either son or daughter. Yes. We're turning around to go and help the Nordic. She's damaged. Yes. The Nordic's leak is above the waterline, but still, leaving it in ice might be dangerous. The icebreaker receives a new order to lead the stricken vessel into clear water. Nordic, over. Stand by to move. Standing by. The seamen who sail these northernmost latitudes are happy knowing that if they're ever in trouble in the Arctic, the icebreakers are there to help. When it's hard to get through, the icebreaker sailors come to get you out of trouble. It's about us. Listen to this song. По полям многолетнего льда, где рассветы туманные, глисты, на буксирах ведем мы сюда, словно в связке в горах альпинисты, и обратно уходим туда, где сигналит о помощи кто-то, постоянные пахари льда. The Nordic has safely been escorted through the ice. Now she's able to make her own way to a safe harbor. There's nothing adventurous about our work. It's mostly routine now. We do the same things and almost never come ashore. Which is a pity, because it would feel great to walk on firm ground again. After spending all this time at sea. The two icebreakers, Taimir and Vaigach, have stopped at an Arctic island, at the center of the northern sea route. But no one can go ashore. All they can do is longingly gaze at the land. There's much to be done. The icebreakers have rendezvoused solely to transfer people and fresh groceries from the Taimir to the Vaigach. The Taimir has only recently left harbor. The Vaigach has now been at sea for more than three months. She is running low on food. Is the Vaigach getting so many tangerines because it'll spend New Year at sea? We've got just as many. The ships will usually stock up with more non-perishable food than they need. And then ships that have only just put to sea will deliver fresh fruit and vegetables. Watch out, careful! The pears shouldn't go underneath watermelons. Don't throw them on pears. No, no pears. Oranges. Oranges are fine, but not pears. Anything can happen in these high latitudes, and the seamen can never be sure when they'll be able to go home next. I'm all energetic because I've just been on vacation. So I've had a rest, and the guys have been here since June. It's not that they're tired, it's just a bit like Groundhog Day for them. The Vigatch has been at sea for four months. There is probably no part of the Northern Sea route that she hasn't been to. We've been everywhere. 
There's no place we haven't visited. The real king here is the polar bear, and icebreakers come second. The icebreakers will now go their separate ways, ready to undertake whatever tasks come their way, to help those who can't get through the ice on their own. The Vygatch is heading east, leading the ship through a heavy storm. They'll have to hurry. Another fleet is waiting for them on the ice border. Thank you. We followed you in the dark. Without your help, we couldn't have moved at that speed. Pivyek is the northernmost town of Russia. Across the strait lies America and the other hemisphere. The crew has just two hours to walk on solid land. As evening descends on the town, it's still early morning aboard the Vygach. There's an eight-hour time difference because the ship remains on home port time. Tomorrow she'll sail west, where yet another fleet awaits safe passage through the ice.